the, um, the, the, the interesting thing about this, about this Schumann recording is um, in, 19, in 1840, in uh, June, uh, Schumann finished what he called his Große, my, my large or great, 20-song uh, cycle on the poems of Heinrich Heine. He called it his Great Heine cycle because he'd already written Opus 24, the Morgen stehe ich auf und frage cycle, uh, which he considered his small, kleine, because it wasn't as many, was it 11 songs or something, 10 songs. Um, and he considered this incredibly important. He wrote in a very short amount of time, in eight days. And he, on the ninth day, wrote to a, a young publishing company called Berthe Bock, which we now know. <laughs> And they stayed in business for all these years, um, and offered the publication. They turned it down because it was there had been too much material on the market already from Schumann, and also it was an enormous publishing project that it, w it was just too big for them. And they simply said, "You know, we should well, but we're not up to this." He then, for the next three years, um, kept approaching publishers. He went to Breitkopf, he went to Bitterbock, he went to another one. I don't remember the name, and he finally ended up in with Paters in 1843. And he, in fact, submitted these songs to Peters in the same uh, convolute as the Frauenleben at Leben, the Camiso poems. Uh, no, I'm sorry, I beg your pardon. That's not true. He, well, I'm thinking of Clara. He, he, he was in the same convolute as poems of settings of songs by Clara Schumann. Since we were talking about Anderson, that's why I didn't. And he gave this to Peters, and Peters was very... Um, I can't say they were very enthusiastic. They were somewhat enthusiastic. The the they certainly were glad to have something more. But you know, Robert was writing a great deal of music, and just like today, they were sort of saying, "Look, you know, we're a little saturated here," sort of thing. And um, also, it was a big cycle, and big cycles were not easy to sell. Um, and so they decided to put it out in two different volumes. First volume of eight of ten songs, the second volume of ten songs, was the first decision. He was paid for twenty songs. Um, he left it with them, and they started the editorial process. He then went on tour to Russia. In the meantime, he had written letters in those three years to different people about the cycle. He had also shown it to um, Wilhelmine Schroederian, mm -hmm. and probably the first person to sing through it. He um, he called it the summit of his his uh, musical writing, his his um, some of it of his of his leader compositions. He um, was paid for twenty songs. And um, he sent them to Clara, and Clara was not disparaging, but she was not as enthusiastic. The letter from him to her with this is, is effusive. I mean, I've never done it. Blah, 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 blah. It reminds you somewhat of how Schubert, when he played the Winterreiser to his friends, his friends sort of looked at each other uneasily and said, my God, what is this? And Schubert very gently said, you know, before it's all said and done in history, you will, one, grow to love these songs, and two, they are, will be considered part of the summit of my, of my work. And certainly he knew what he was talking about. And I think Schumann had the same sort of feeling about these songs. He then went on tour to Russia. We have a, a very strange situation in that, in that usually there's the manuscript and somebody rewrites it out, in what they call a Reinschrift. And then there's usually the first, the first plates, you know, that print the music and then they get corrected and all that sort of thing. And usually, in fact, in all of other Schumann's works, we have bits of that process where you can see the process of working. We don't have any of that with this cycle. What we have is the manuscript, which is still intact and exists in Berlin, uh, in the in the what used to be called the East German Bibliothek, which is now just simply the Prussian Bibliothek, and um, or actually German Bibliothek. I don't know what the exact title of the library is, but it's laying there. There is no, there is no indication of of any tampering with the score. The the score has in its manuscript engravers instructions from Schumann throughout the piece. Uh, all of the songs continue on the same paper into the next song, so forth and so on. And he originally had this as Opus 29 dedicated to Mendelssohn. It then came out uh, as Opus 48 dedicated to Schröder-Dravien, who probably sang the first performance. 
some people have theorized that there was a falling out with Mendelssohn or he was tense with Mendelssohn or something and, and or Mendelssohn didn't like the songs therefore he changed his dedication. It's not true. The reason why the dedication got changed is because in the meantime, in this three years he was trying to get it published, which surprised him it took so long to get it published. In fact, Mendelssohn had received the, the dedication of string quartets and piano pieces and so forth, and Schroeder de Villain had become a very important part of his performing and musical circle, as well as Julia Stockhausen. The man who gave the first performance of Frauen Leben und Leben. Oh, really? Not only the first man performance, but the first performance performance, oh. you know, which I think is wonderful. And this cycle came out from manuscript to first edition with nothing in the meantime, was then published as Opus 48 with a title on it called The Dichterliebe. The Dichterliebe has 16 songs, not 20 songs. And in those 16 songs, there are very serious musical differences in the setting of text, especially some harmonic differences, missing, missing not missing measures, but changed measures uh, in, in postludes. Um, it's kind of a detective story. I, st I came across this, I became fascinated with it because I was learning the Dichterliebe again for performance, and I picked up the Peter's Urtext. And in the back of the Urtext are all these revision notes where they say, or say, well, this source has this, and this source has that. And continually the manuscript was referred to, and continually things like there would be no tempo marking or no dynamic marking at the beginning of a song. But in the manuscript there is, but there isn't in the first edition. Well, that doesn't make any sense. Why would somebody, you know? And when you actually, well, so I decided I needed a closer look at this. So I, in fact, I was working on this Mahler project with a colleague of mine, and she was in Berlin looking at, at the at the Mahler Humoreskin, and I said, you know, why don't you pop over and, and see if you can get a hold of this thing and have a look at it. And, and <laughs> the librarian, when he received our call, fortunately was a fan of Lieder and fortunately knew my name, so it was a little bit more accessible than somewhat East Germans could be, <laughs> and um, said, oh, thank goodness someone's finally looking at this again. You know? There was a treatise about this very question of the manuscript of Dichterliebe to the first edition of around 1906 or 7 by a man named Wolf, W-O-L-F-F, -F, in that wonderful magazine who for <laughs> monetary supply and demand reasons, like everything else in this damn world, went under, called Die Musik, which is one of the great sources of information at the turn of the century of, of musical and cultural development mm. in Central Europe. You can still collect old copies, and, and I'm fortunate to have a big collection of, of most of them. And this is one of them. And it's a fascinating, fascinating study in which, in which Wolf, uh, Mr. Wolf absolutely articulates for, for serious reasons that, that, in fact, all of the changes rounding out of musical phrases um, that, of the setting of the text that I referred to always are for a musical aesthetic reason, whatever influence that is and always to the detriment of the German language. What, what this manuscript shows is that, is that Schumann was so ahead of his time in the setting of the German text. For instance, am leuchtenden Sommermorgen. That's the undulating 6-8 tempo. Am leuchtenden Sommermorgen geh ich im Garten herum. This is rather late in the cycle, depending on the numbering. It's around, I think, number 13 in the cycle, in which, in which this person, which again we're also missing the prologue of the Lyrische Sintermezzo, which tells us it's, it's an old knight, which is uh, metaphoric for, for, a, for an experienced person having fought the battles of war and that sort of thing, mm -hmm. battles of life, sitting in the attic of his room looking out through a window watching his life go by. And that's the sort of the story of the Lyrische Sintermezzo, which means a lyric a lyric, intermezzo has the feeling of something that goes between things, but it also, intermezzo is something that is, implies uh, perhaps um, um, an interlude in life's seasons. Um, it could also imply the interlude through which you reflect on the different seasons you've been through and are going to. Um, it also is in the structure of Buch der Lieder between the first part of the book and the third part of the book. Anyway, he tells this wonderful story of, of unrequited love, and he tells it in very much terms of, uh, Heine tells this in very much terms through the eyes of the night, in, in metaphorical terms, in a thing we call the Bildersprache, which is quite literally sign language or picture language, where, where words and natural, natural 
phenomenon or use as metaphor for personal experience. That was the basis of, say, Teskaram Wunderhorn. Heine declared himself in his own lifetime with Buchter Lieder and this, and this whole poetic device as the last of the Romantics and the first of the moderns. Because what he did in that poetry, in that very gentle, even in something as simple as Die Rose, Die Lili, Die Taube, Die Sonne, he would take the metaphor and use it in its metaphorical sense, in its structure, in the third person, but then say, Ich aber liebe die eine, die reine, die kleine, die feine, and use adjectives. And so what was, what was third person pronouns then became adjectives of the first person experience. And it's really quite, quite remarkable how he did this. Well, anyway, to get back to Am Leuchten and Sommermorgen, where this knight is, is, is starting to lose his gra grip on reality, what Schumann actually wrote in the manuscript was instead of da di da da di da di da, he wrote am leuchtenden Sommermorgen gehe ich im Garten herum, right? Mm. Which is much more the syntax of the German language. It's also through the cycle a very sophisticated and subtle use of the of syncopation. And let's see if I can articulate this right. It's my own little pet theory, and I'm, I'm writing notes for the new Wiener Urtext edition. But it's kind of fun to look at that when the when the when this knight K N I G H T is sitting and he's looking and he's looking in in reality as he sees it, but would be unreal unreal to us or not reality. Would be dream his dreaming. It's a very even rhythm. But when he is disturbed, when he sees something and articulates what's happening to him in our reality, where he's having to fit in, it becomes syncopated. And this happens all the For instance, in the, in the fourth song, instead of Und wenn ich lehn an deine Brust becomes Und wenn ich mich lehn an deine Brust Right. Uh, also, in the, in, the, in the songs that were taken out, which all four of the songs that are not that are deleted, and we do not know why, we do not. I've been through back through every generation of Schumann writings, musicological studies. I mean, all the way back, and all of it is based upon conjecture on a couple of sten sentences that the statements that Schumann gave that that contradict themselves. One that he always fiddled with things is what he said of himself. But he all he also at another time said, My first instinct is all the one that always the one that was right and that's the one I usually banked on. You know, so excuse me, case point closed. But the articulation of this whole process of editing the Dichtity, but anything we know about that period in Clara's music, is hearsay. It is the recollections of an assistant to the assistant of the printer. <laughs> and they were printed something like forty years after Schumann's death. Sorry, too many filters for me, you know. And in fact, is not enlightening at all. He's not at all articulate in saying. I mean, they just didn't keep track of these kinds of things. It wasn't that salient. So my passion about this whole cycle and why we did this, and, and Savalish and I had long conversations about it. In fact, I went to Savalish when I was first studying this, and I said, I didn't know him very well, and I was doing uh, opera for him, and he was conducting in, in Munich. And I said, I have a special project and some questions. Would you see me? And he, in fact, did. And I said, I'm either, I'm either really ignorant, crazy, naive, and, and impudent, and forgive me for taking too much time, or this is something that we, you know, one should have a look at, and, and I just wonder what this is all about, and, and, and ultimately, would you be interested in having a closer look at it itself? So I took the materials, and, and I came back um, about five weeks later to work with him again, and he had, in fact, looked at them, and he said, <laughs> we need to talk. <laughs> and he was fascinated. He said, tell me what this is all about. So we talked and talked and talked and talked and looked at some things. And over a period of about five or six months, he became very convinced of it. I've, I've since actually done the cycle with him. I've done the cycle with Christoph Eschenbach. Uh, I've sent it to uh, Wolfram, uh, Alfred Brendel, and I see him in December. He's quite, quite um, enthusiastic about it. Wiener Urtext, um, which is a division of Universal and, well, actually a division of Schott Publishing, is starting a new leader's circle cycle. Um, well, actually, we're starting a new leader cycle that, of, of printing, you know, new volumes of leader. And this will be the kickoff of publication, so people will be able to have it. I've sung it in recital throughout Central Europe, and I sang it uh, sang it in New York to rather dismissing cynical notice, and I sang it to, in San Francisco to rather enthusiastic mm -hmm. um, 
fascination. I'm not trying to supplant the Dichtedeva by any means, mm -hmm. not by any means, yeah. whatever. But the enigma of its creation is yeah. to me so significant that they really should be side by side to have a look at it. Mm -hmm. I think with the 20 song version, you have a different respect, Schumann's respect, to Heine than you maybe get from the Dichtedeva. The only salient point of the Dichtedeva, as we know it, that has always bothered me, which I just don't find congruous either to Heine or even Schumann's at attitude to Heine, is this business of unrequited love. And it comes up most significantly in a song like Ich Kolle Nicht, mm -hmm. in which we have been told and hammered on and trained to believe is this finger-pointing accusation to this woman who has this black heart, even though she's dressed up in nice garb and has, in fact, a snake eating at her heart. He says in the last song, or the last part of the song, that pre to prevent you from loving me. And that is exactly not true. For one thing, in the Bildersprache, in which metaphor of nature's symbols, the, s the snake is never used as an adjective of a person's personality. Oh, you snake, or he acts like a snake. Mm -hmm. The snake is always, in and of itself, the symbol of something else, usually an evil destiny. And also this word elend, das du elend bist, means, means that, that, that you're an elende person, can mean that your behavior is, and Wagner develops this very much in his writings, can mean that you are, alent literally means um, awful or horrible or, or disgusting, but it most often is an adjective for the, for the feeling one has of themselves. If, if you can ask somebody even today in, in modern German, you know, if you know that they're sick or somebody, you say, well, how are you, how, how are you doing? He says, I'm against alent. I, I really feel awful. I feel terrible. Ailent is like, you know, the flu times two kind of feeling, right? Well, in personality or something that is really distressful to one's, you know, love life or, or something, because it's unrequited, because they can't have it, one says, you know, ich sah mein lieb, wie sehr du elend bist, is not an accusation. He identifies, he empathizes with her and sees it. In fact, the next poem goes on from that in a book right over there. Uh, goes on for that and said, yes, you are ailent. I am also ailent, my love, because we can't have this love together and so forth. And the whole point of this unrequitedness is not because of the inability, well, it is somewhat the inability of the woman, but in a more forgiving sense, but in fact that, that fate, the real salient point of the Lyricis Intermezzo as a 64 poem exploration of the, of the dark side of this night's experience is in fact that, that the destiny, fate, has not allowed him to realize the love that he, in fact, has found for himself. It goes one dimension past that, and that, and that's very romantic and very German, in that the knight, in his articulation of this, he's mostly forgiving and sweet, and but he's also, he is somewhat accusatory to her, because he sees past what she can't herself envision to say, you know, I, I see that even though you act happy, you're not really happy, that kind of attitude. Um, but he never accuses her of being malicious. He never, he, he accuses the circumstance and how she acts towards him as sometimes being malicious. But she can't do anything else. She has no idea how awful he feels. It's kind of like the Anderson with the Der Spielmann. Mm. You know, what, uh, he's, that this, this poor musician, this violinist, is standing there playing a wedding party, and at the last we find out that, find out the wedding party, in fact, is for, for the woman that he thought he was going to marry. Uh, you know, it's like a Jane Austen novel. It's very much like Pushkin. It's a very 19th century uh, uh, substance. But that's the point of the Lucius Intermezzo. And what irks me is that I've read so often in sort of very accessible literature, very, very available literature, I should say, today, by Schubert, Schumann scholars, that the Dichterliebe, as beautiful as it is, is somehow a failed work because Schumann never really understood the irony of Heine. And I think that's just boulder dash. I think if there was anybody that understood, for one, anything literary in the 19th century, it was Robert Schumann. And I think that that it's completely incongruous with the rest of his settings of Heine, and that's why this whole album that did with Schumann, or Schumann, Savalisch of Schumann, is all the Heine settings. And we see what's remarkable is we see this development of the Heinechen language through his through his work, and starting with the Der Amapeta and going through the Opus 24, and then ending up with this. He understood full well what Heine was doing, and if we'd give him, you know, due breath with his with with in fact this manuscript, this. This, and, and actually there are, there are traces in the manuscript at certain times where he did at some point come back with a different pen, whether it was in the same week or 500 years later or five years later, we don't know. 
but a different pen at a different time in a different mood did play around with some some cadences, did play around with some harmonies. Um, but the the bits that got deleted in the postludes, the songs that got taken out, and as much conjecture as so many people have offered, especially in the 20th century, that, oh, this song was too insulting to the father. I think of, of uh, Es leuchtet meine Liebe, a fantastic song that, that, that presages or preludes Wolf, uh, his Coptishist lead, with incredible moving, impossible to play. I've never played it. Danny Barenboim played through it, and it's the only song I've ever heard him swear at, because it's, you know, it's impossible, thirds and sixths moving in, in the right hand, and the sort of fantasy land, and it preambles, it, without a doubt, the the, the penultimate song, the Aus uh, Atemärchen Winktes, but more importantly, it talks about a virgin a fighting knight and a, and, a, and a huge monster from the forest that comes out and he fights and in fact the, the Ritter dies. And so some, somebody came up with a brilliant idea that in fact this was uh, too metaphorically close to the fight that he had with Clara Wieck's father about marriage and so forth and therefore the song was deleted so they wouldn't offend Papa. Well, I mean, that, that kind of stuff is just complete nauseous to me. It's nauseating. It irritates me. It, 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 it's stupid. Um, uh, it, I mean, it's just, it really is, <laughs> it just makes me crazy. <laughs> so I, I don't know, I, I um, but again, I'm not trying to interpret or tell people. I just, I think that it's very interesting to put something in as, in as balanced and, and honest, objective light and shadow as possible, recreate it, and let people make up their own minds. Right. And uh, it's been a fascinating project when I stumbled into. I was the only project I've actually gone after because I felt that, that it, it was uh, so important, hadn't been looked at, and hadn't been done, was the was the editing of the Knaben Wunderhorn songs of Gustav Mahler in the piano version. And uh, from then I've sort of tripped onto different different theories. Everybody thinks I'm sort of out there trying to find the next uh, next project to make myself look clever. I'm, I don't look at myself as a cowboy through the repertoire. <laughs> but there are some there are some fun con connects and and uh, ideas that 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 I think in heighten the enthusiasm for the repertoire and Absolutely. make people more interested in coming in and hear something. Absolutely. And and composers that paths crossed or or one of my favorite things to do and, and uh, I, I think I can modestly say it probably kind of restarted that as a momentum in programming today, as I'm seeing it a lot from my from my other colleagues, is different composers setting of the same text mm -hmm. source. And that is a wonderful way to look at things. It's it's a uh, it's horrifying to record companies because they can't then put it in the Schumann box if it's got Weber and, and Meyerbeer and everything else. They don't really know what to do with it. And, I, and for instance, the Deskanam and Wunderhorn album that I did, not only is it very often in, in the Mahler bin, even though it's got eight different composers on it, um, it's now starting to find itself in the Hampson bin, thank you very much, but it actually got reviewed that way as well. Well, Mr. Hampson obviously is trying to supplant the great Mahler cycle of Deskanam and Wunderhorn, which is not a cycle, it's a collection of songs, but anyway. Uh, with his own his own attempt, and in some ways successful, but mostly uh, inept, you know, or something like that. <laughs> okay, fine, <laughs> you know, you missed the point. Go home. <laughs> it isn't that. It's it's about it's about textual sources. And yeah, yeah. Yeah, but I, I can't complain about that album. It's actually been it, it was it was enormously successful, and people for the most part got the point. It's just always astounding when, especially when something is as popular as that album was, and 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 was obvious in its point as it was that somebody would be so be so wholly ignorant, but that's yeah. life. <laughs> but the Schumann's, a, the Schumann's a fascinating, fascinating project. And the more I look at Schumann, the more, uh, you know, he found a musical way to set Heine, and he found a different musical way to set Rückert, who actually was his favorite, his favorite poet to set, and Reinecke, and uh, some Goethe, you know, they all have their, their own musical slant, as subtle as it is. And I, I just wonder sometimes, and of course Eichendorff, the great settings of Eichendorff, I wonder if we, we we give that enough attention, that subtlety of musical uh, setting. So it's, it's, it always bothers me to hear people talk about a Schumann song or a Schumann style. It's kind of like the Verdi baritone. I don't know what that means. I mean, as far as I can see, if, if there was a Verdi baritone, there was at least five different species of it. It's the same when we talk about, oh, Schubert songs, you know. Which of the 675 do you mean, and what period in his life, and what poetic source, under what pretensions was he writing, and so forth and so on. 
and to me, that's the stuff that makes it alive and interesting. And it's that that world that that all my programming, all my work, CD-ROM, web page here, all that kind of stuff here and there that I want to get into, and and perhaps a perhaps a book if I ever had time to do something like that. But um, it's just to arm general people, normal people, with a uh, iconography, a road map through the different contexts so they can make decisions on their own and they're not simply victims of of not only critics or journalists but also of performers either peculiar perspective or or or, or idiosyncratic perspective or no perspective mostly it's just to make it as real an experience of the poem and song for each individual as, as possible so they can make up their own mind. It's not important what I think about the Dichtadiva. It's important what you think about the Dichtadiva, or Mrs. This, or Mr. That, or Miss, or Mr. That. You know, it's 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 an individual experience, and I, I think we need to protect the integrity of that more and more in our programming and our emphasis in in, in uh, leader exploration. That it in fact is a very personal experience. And what you get out of it is what you're able and at that point in your life to get out of it. And that is as fluctuating as our life's ebb and flow is, and that's the beauty of poetry, it seems to me. But we're in the same path together, and that's what's refreshing and reassuring. We have been talking with Thomas Hampson uh, about a subject that you have great passion, obviously, <laughs> and I think that's come across to all of us as well. well thank thank you. you so much for taking time out to do this. Thank you for the conversation. Mm.